something you may or may not have noticed about the original Pathologic's three endings that don't involve the plague killing everyone is that the leader of the town in the aftermath is always a woman. Pathologic contains a lot of discussion around ideas of the matriarchy. In Artemis' ending, there may be the new Republic of Children coming to power, a sort of democracy, but the unquestioned leader is Capella, with other girls becoming the new mistresses. In Clara's ending, she becomes the new saint of the town and the unquestioned leader to whom everyone bows and inevitably sacrifices themselves. And in The Bachelor's ending, it is Maria Cana, the Scarlet Mistress, who gathers to her feet an army of loyal servants and remakes the town, or, or the world even, in her image, standing astride the world like a goddess looking down from her throne atop the polyhedron. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself with that. Maria is the oldest of Victor Kane's two children, and the third oldest out of the four surviving members of the Kane family as the events of the game begin. She has an attachment to the polyhedron, having once been in command there herself as Khan is now. She remains a connection, the leader of the ex-children, the young adults whom the polyhedron eventually and inevitably rejected. Maria then does not straddle two worlds, but instead gazes towards the future. You'll notice that this is a running theme in the game. This is what makes Pathologic's characters so human. They aren't thinking just about immediate or near future concerns. They're also looking into the far future with the hopes and dreams and goals that come attached to that. The polyhedron means something different to Maria now than it might have done before when she might have felt like Khan. To her, it is a throne, perhaps even a crown, as well as the founding stone of her future society, one built in the sky. It will be a fantastic, miraculous society with rigid rules and required obedience for things to progress nicely as she sees. Maria is, even more so than her brother, an authoritarian, as the developers say, a despot. The idea of Maria's matriarchy is one that we can discuss. What would Maria's matriarchy look like? How can we understand the idea of a female despot? Uh, Livia Gershon explains. In 1861, Swiss anthropologist Johann Jakob Bakofen published a study of ancient societies in which he argued that female rule was one early stage in social development. Bakofen claimed that matriarchy emerges from an earlier social order called heterism, characterized by unregulated sexuality and female powerlessness. In his view, uh, women fought back against the state of affairs, taking a dominant role, controlling property, ruling within their families, and gaining political power. In a still later stage, Bakofen and other scholars believed men took power from their matriarchs, instituting patriarchy. In India, there's a female-led society known as the Kasi. The Kasi live in northeastern India as well as parts of Bangladesh. They have a democratic-run society. Their most important part is, as Gershon and I explains, when European anthropologists began looking at the Kasi in the 19th century as part of the British colonial domination of India, they recognized their systems as matrilineal, uh, that is, property passed to the woman, and matrilocal, that is, a custom and marriage whereby the husband goes to live with the wife's community, but did not classify them as matriarchal. That's because at the level of states and villages, men lead Kasi political institutions, such as the court system, and only men are allowed in local councils. This, however, is a very patriarchal understanding of power, Banerjee writes. Those who subscribe to this view consider power only to be a means and an agent of domination. Wherever power was not used to dominate, it was considered to be no power at all. That last quote I really like. Maria might be removed from the more peaceful Kasi people in that they don't seek to exercise political power in a large or harmful way, but Maria's struggle to ascend to power is reflected in her almost brute force tactics, but reinforced with a certain amount of natural feminine charm that she leans on. This leads to the great awful paradox of the fact that women have to exercise power and show desire for power to achieve it, but the very act of exercising power and wanting things is considered to be unfeminine and thus incorrect. The town, while playing, has a mostly patriarchal society, but there's a definite shift in power at the end of the game, especially the endings of the original game. In the English Middle Ages, uh, a book known as the Gesta Stefani, uh, or the Deeds of King Stephen, laments how a woman might take power, speaking of Empress Matilda, who fought to give her son the throne after the throne was taken from her. She at once put on an extremely arrogant demeanour instead of the modest gait and proper bearing to the gentle sex, the Gestas author complains, began to walk and speak and do all things more stiffly and more haughtily than she had been wont, to such a point that soon, in the capital of the land subject to her, she actually made herself queen of all England and gloried in being so called. Maria's story sounds a lot like this, right? 
Maria has an extremely arrogant demeanor. At the beginning of the Bachelor story, she admits to him that she is used to having men bow and grovel before her, and that to ask him for anything shames, even demeans her, and it's very difficult for her to do. She becomes more and more confident, and one could perhaps say arrogant, as the story continues as she reaches her full power. She actually made herself ruler of the town, and gloried in being so called. Through the influence of her dead mother Nina's spirit, she begins to walk and speak, and do things more stiffly and more haughtily than she had been wont, and her acquisition of power comes through understanding and balancing perfectly the expectation of a society with patriarchal rulers as a woman. She shows a more traditional feminine strength and an understanding of power and how to achieve it in a way associated with domination, strength, and power. Carrying on with this sort of idea, an interesting thing that happens to Maria over the course of the game is a conflict in her own mind that, to many players, might make her seem hysterical or unfit for power, especially in the second game, where our perspective as Artemy makes her seem especially depraved, reckless, or even crazy. I speak Lodge is possibly playing on the old, dated idea of Hysteros. This was a Greco-Roman idea, an idea from antiquity, that you might find a lot of media plays up, uh, even in bits and pieces, even today, though some are less aware of this idea than others. Hysteros, derived from the Greek word for womb, means pertaining to or about the uterus slash womb. It also relates to hysteria, which Oxford defines as an old-fashioned term for a psychological disorder characterized by conversion of psychological stress into physical symptoms or a change in self-awareness such as selective amnesia, etc. In more modern terms, hysteria means more simply exaggerated or uncontrollable emotion or excitement. Often this kind of idea is weaponized against women and was an ancient argument arguing that women should not rule or hold significant power because they have less control over themselves and their emotions than men. Obviously uh, a pretty insane idea, but people genuinely believe this. Some people unfortunately still do. It's, it's a flawed argument. As that argument goes, if a woman cannot control herself, how can she control others? Ice Pick Lodge forces you, even unconsciously, to confront this kind of idea with Maria, who seems this clearly strongly driven woman with a fierce willpower, who, over the course of the game, falls prey to fear in the spirit of her dead mother, and is presented as young and inexperienced. But if you give her the benefit of the doubt, she rises from these fears as a phoenix, ablaze and ready to seize the reins of power. Some players, however, might see only these old sexist ideas regarding the way women think and act, especially young women, who some see as the least responsible demographic. But that might not even be any conscious fault of their own, but rather Icepick Lodge weaving these ideas and perceptions into the fabric of the game, forcing them to confront unconscious biases or messages received from other media. In the scene in Pathologic 2 where you confront Maria, who is busy condemning people to death by drawing chalk marks on doors, she seems to be completely out of her mind, yet domineering in a potentially intimidating way. Maria is a force of nature all of her own. She says Earth is the least attractive element. To fly, you only need air, water, and fire, she says in one of her spoken dialogue lines, proving her loyalty to the Cain family ideology of height and breaking earthly boundaries and limitations, yet the line also showcases her initiative, her confidence. Take another of her spoken lines, this one from Pathologic Classic. Great souls are not those who have fewer passions and more virtues than the common, but only those who have greater designs. Emotion is not a weakness, showing passion or having a vice. Failing in the face of what one could call virtue is not necessarily the foundation of a good person, argues Maria. Maria has a greater design for the world, that is for certain, and her emotions, which she gains control of over the course of the story, just make her more powerful. In the heteronormative, that is, where straight is seen as the baseline normal sexual status, patriarchal, that is, men considered as the natural and only leaders, society, an emotional woman is traditionally seen as fairly unfit to rule. Maria is the opposite to this idea. She crushes the opposition at the end of the Bachelor story with her power and her confidence, and threatens slash promises to come into her own fully and completely with the diurnal ending in Pathologic 2. But what makes Maria such a great human character is not just her incredible confidence and power, it is her human flaws and doubts. Like many characters in Pathologic, she is incredibly fearful of falling ill, and obviously for good reason. Quite a few of her voice lines have her ask the player whether or not she's showing any symptoms. Several times throughout the game, she also wishes her mother Nina was here to help the town through its darkest hour. In spite of Maria wishing to present herself as a character who is uh, unstoppable, a character who wants to be immortal, to live for just one more year, one more endless year, 
She recognizes the flaws and failings of her own body, just as Georgie and Victor do, and as Simon discovered when he caught the plague. Limitations are the thing that haunts the canes most, and if there is one limitation that the canes cannot stand, it is death. Maria is afraid of death, just like basically everyone. Even for a person with the powers of the Dark Mistress, the veil that half the town steps through over the course of the game threatens to take her too. But it is not fear alone that defines her. She has her hopes, dreams and aspirations too. As her confidence builds to a mighty crescendo in the last few days, she becomes seemingly fearless. Her mother's spirit has come back to her at last, and yet she makes the powers of the Dark Mistress her own. Something I wanted to talk about as well before we talk about the prevalence of ideas of matriarchy and pathologic is the idea that the, that the developers themselves connected to Maria, the idea of the eternal feminine. I'll just read Wikipedia's definition of this concept to get you contextualized. So the eternal feminine is a psychological archetype or philosophical principle that idealizes the immutable concept of woman. It is one component of gender essentialism, the belief that men and women have different core essences that cannot be altered by time or environment. The conceptual ideal was particularly vivid in the 19th century when women were often depicted as an angelic responsible for drawing men upward on a moral and spiritual path. Among those virtues variously regarded as essentially feminine are modesty, gracefulness, purity, delicacy, civility, compliancy, reticence, chastity, affability, and politeness. This seems a lot like the idea of hysteros, but bundled in a slightly more elegant package. If women aren't these emotionally driven, hysterical creatures, this concept argues, then perhaps they are something else. An impossible standard to which we should hold them at all times. This is obviously patently unfair. Looked at through the dated, dusty lens of the eternal feminine, women are not there to impede men, as Hysteros argues, but they are there to guide and cheerlead men, to be an impossible ideal to be held to. If women are ever imperfect, who do not show virtue at all times, they are to be cast down not, and not listened to. And if women follow these virtues, they will never do or say anything controversial, conveniently. Modesty, gracefulness, compliance, reticence, these are not the adjectives to describe a proactive go-getter who fights for themselves and for other people. And these hardly seem like the words to describe M Maria either. Writer Simone de Beauvoir rejected the idea of the eternal feminine and famously declared, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. An article helps me explain that the eternal feminine those behaviours and character traits that set women apart from men were humanly created, Beauvoir argued, not natural. Rather than evidencing a perverted female essence or mistaken choice, feminine traits reflected a woman's situation. For Beauvoir, woman's biological nature could never be experienced apart from the second social nature. The body and with it body consciousness were always historically mediated. Society and the self creates ideals of the masculine and the feminine. The typical norm of masculinity can be harmful to both women and men alike. So how does Maria fit into the idea of the eternal feminine? The developers certainly seem to think she does. I think they intended to have the idea of both Hysteros and this eternal feminine floating around the character as challenges to the player and challenges for Maria herself to overcome. She's haunted by expectation on basically all fronts and finds herself fairly alone as a character when the game begins. Her closest relationship is probably to Capella, whom she sees as a worthy rival. They're probably close because they have the most similar experience to one another and both of them prefer to avoid Katerina, whom Maria especially sees as a failure, having crumbled under the weight of expectation. But whereas Maria could be said to treat Katerina with disdain because she was not strong enough to bear the burden does not mean she is necessarily any better off shouldering the burden herself. But the main difference between the two is that Maria succeeds where Katerina fails. Maria manages to carry herself through the expectations that rest on her shoulders and emerge stronger for it. At the beginning of the game, she was, as the developers describe her in the design document, barely more than a child, very mature, expected to act a certain way, and is deeply stressed and haunted by that fact. She does not feel ready to bear the burden of the town, even as she claims to be its voice, knowing already what is best for it. By the end, she is confident and proud, and the thoughts she has on the town have coalesced. As the town lies in ruins beneath her feet in The Bachelor's Ending in Pathologic 1, she uses the polyhedron as the foundation, not the earth. The miracle of the polyhedron is the jumping off point for the future she envisions, where all bow to her, the despotic mistress who will build utopia out of ruin. And yet, Maria, Maria's options in life are actually fairly limited during the events of the game. As Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique explains, the mystique referenced in the title had been created by those in power who portrayed women as unemployed, uneducated wives, 
mothers and sex bombs. Women were being defined by their biology alone, while men had their pick of roles in society. The women who hold actual power in the society of the town are mistresses all, or they will grow to become so. Maria will soon be married to young Vlad, a secret utopian. Young Vlad is very much in love with her and agrees to help her run the day to day, even while she holds the absolute power. It is also worth noting that young Vlad's role as heir is already determined for him by the simple circumstance of his birth as well. In that way, they're quite similar. Maria's reign, especially with young Vlad's financial assistance, would be inalienable and unassailable, at least to the common, ordinary folk. The ties of two royal families with the Canes cemented firmly at the top. The dreams of a utopian future will come true. That is, if Maria has anything to say about it. Our whims are more freakish than whims of destiny, she says. The Canes certainly do have these freakish ideas, and Maria is the one who is closest to actually bringing these ideas to reality, to fruition. A lot of what I said about Khan in the previous video is probably applicable to Maria as well. It just so happens that Maria seems to wield more power than Khan, at least on a symbolic and spiritual level, throughout the game. Uh, whereas Khan has a more practical power, I suppose you'd say. Whether you want to debate whether or not the uh, mistresses have any genuine power, the people of the town believe fully in that power, the power of the feminine. This, of course, gives the mistresses power, Maria most of all. As the oldest mistress with respect and power, she is in a position to command the people of the town in a way that Capella is not ready for, and Changeling might not be able to inherit if she doesn't get enough power. Maria is also somewhat narcissistic and self-aggrandizing. Her natural power begets the desire for more power, she wants a more substantial power and recognition from the society in which she lives. Whether or not you believe she will make the town better is a decision left to each individual player. Maria is bundled up in these ideas of matriarchy and, as a young woman struggling to come into her inheritance, will strive for sales the town from basically all angles, is a character who naturally has a weight of expectation placed firmly on her and not just from the other characters. Icepick Lodge have basically written in a predisposition to question Maria and what she truly represents, making her a challenging character to approach and perhaps a difficult one to like. She's visibly icy, she doesn't particularly like talking to Artemy, and she scares the hell out of Changeling, although in turn Maria herself is scared of Aglaia Lilich, the Inquisitor, and her aunt, whose power trumps even hers for a time. Aglaia, as Nina's sister, carries a certain amount of similar power, and her elevated status gives her that additional power that Maria herself craves. I'll get into discussing both Nina and Aglaia another day, probably lumped together I'd imagine, but Maria's conflict with Aglaia reflects the internal conflict she has with herself. Aglaia is yet another woman Maria has to live up to, a woman who holds incredible power, who, if Maria is not strong enough, not smart enough, will destroy Maria without hesitation. Maria has the risk of being consumed by her mother's spirit. It is Victor who takes on that particular burden in the end. Maria's survival is dependent on how well she can cling to power in a world that tends to reject female power, especially fledgling female power. To finish the video, I just wanted to talk briefly about Maria's connection with the color red in Pathologic 2. In Classic HD, her outfit was one more like marble, dark purple, and stylistically quite strange. Purple, though, traditionally represents luxury and royalty. Roman magistrates often wore purple. Uh, in Europe, the origins of the color purple as being synonymous with wealth and luxury comes from the Phoenicians. By contrast, red is synonymous with leadership, willpower, and danger, as well as some amount of sensitivity. Maria's uh, color being shifted from luxury in the original to a more direct symbolic color for leadership and danger is, I think, uh, a more apt symbolic recognition for what her character means and represents. While Maria might be of the nobility, she is the member of the nobility closest to control, leadership, and of course this willpower that she has. Maria's willpower proves to be one of the strongest the town has to offer, and it is truly indomitable should the player's choices bring her to ultimate power. Maria is a reflection of traditional ideas of the feminine explored secondhand through a video game. She is a connection to memories of oppression, repression, and quite a few sad truths of the modern era. Maria's ascent to power is revelatory. A confirmation of the strength of the mistresses and a reminder of the strength that comes from self-belief and familial ties, while also being a cautionary tale about the dangers of self-obsession and totalitarian power. 
When a system like the town collapses in on itself, Maria is one of the kind of rulers who could arise. Self-confident, self-assured, even miraculous, yet not tolerating dissent and frequently insulting those who she sees as lesser. As with all Pathologic characters, she is a very human construction, flaws and aspirations clear for all to see, but fe also fairly muddy and difficult to resolve into a complete picture of binary good and evil. Just like everyone we meet in real life, Maria is marvellously contradictive at times but always fascinating, a reminder that human beings, for all their flaws, are worth paying attention to sometimes. Thanks to everyone who's been watching my previous character analysis videos, and to everyone as well who just generally hangs out on my channel and uh, listens to the Pathologic soundtrack. I think that's what everyone does around here. It's my pleasure to be able to make these videos, and I hope you continue to stay tuned in to my channel when I make more videos in future. Thanks for leaving all your feedback on the previous videos. Uh, I hope to see some more here, and thanks so much for all your kind words. Pleasure. Uh, new video, hopefully, 